In a previous video, I talked about YouTube stalkers, and if you think those guys were bad, just wait until you find out about pop star stalkers. When you have an attractive young person whose entire job is to make them seem relatable, you're bound to have a couple creeps going too far. And today we'll be talking about one of those cases in the J-pop community. In a previous episode of Internet Mysteries, I talked about the stalking and eventual murder of Christina Grimmy. It's a tragic tale about how an obsessive fan took a parasocial relationship to heart. Then once their idol did something they felt betrayed them, they sought revenge. While extreme, unfortunately, tales like these aren't an uncommon phenomenon in the entertainment industry. In fact, stories of deranged fans turning to violence have become recurrent. Though we'll be discussing a couple of stories today, these ones will be focusing on the Japanese pop industry, otherwise known as J-pop. So without further ado, let's dive deep. Our first story begins in early 2016 when 27-year-old Tomohiro Iwazaki became a fan of J-pop. Iwazaki was described by his family as being gentle and childlike in nature, though they admitted that he was unskilled in expressing his emotions. He was a loner, with his relatives failing to recall him having a single real-life friend. This isolation could explain why. After watching only a few of her performances, he became so attached to underground idol Mayu Tomita. In fact, he became so strongly obsessed with her that he immediately developed a desire to marry the musician. Mayu was a small-time Japanese singer and actress who appeared in a handful of television shows when she was younger. At the time, she was only 21 years of age and did events when she wasn't attending her local university. Even today, her Twitter account has less than 15,000 followers, indicating that she was much more accessible to fans than other larger figures in the industry. This would be to the delight of Iwazaki. Overcome with love, he began stalking her across social media. He reportedly left hundreds of comments across both her blog and her Twitter to no response. In spite of his unhinged behavior, his family didn't suspect a thing. He apparently kept his fascination so well hidden that they didn't even know he liked this woman until it was too late. In spite of constantly being ignored, Iwazaki seemed to remain undeterred. For weeks, his parasocial relationship with her continued until February when his ill-fated obsession finally came to a head. It was that month that Iwazaki would send a box of gifts to Tomita's home address. Included in this box were a watch as well as several unspecified books. It was, in his eyes, an attempt to make a move so he could marry his true love. As he waited in anticipation for a response, however, the realization that these feelings weren't reciprocated began to sink in. Tensions grew as the months passed and he slowly realized that a response may never come. As a result, in late April, his fascination with the idol turned into a burning hatred. He began sending hateful messages to Tomita, with the reported total being over 400. Keep in mind that these were all sent in the time span of a month. After being continuously ignored and eventually blocked by her, he then began directing his vitriol towards another female performer who had sung on the same stage as her. He sent her deranged messages as well, demanding that she tell Tomita to return all of his gifts. He was desperate for any kind of response. After pestering this other performer for over 10 days, his wishes were eventually fulfilled. But when his box of gifts eventually did return, all he felt was humiliation. He knew without a doubt that he had been rejected. This led him to start writing comments such as, I will never forget that I was looked down upon by you, and it would be radical to kill just because one was rejected by a girl. Realizing that she could potentially be in legitimate danger, Tomita began taking preemptive measures to protect herself. Aside from blocking him, on May 9th, she reported his death threats to the local police station. Instead of helping her, however, local authorities were dismissive. They claimed that his threats didn't constitute an immediate danger because they were on social media. Thus, in spite of her efforts to secure protection, she was left vulnerable. Twelve days after she visited the police station, on May 21st, 2016, Tomita was set to perform at a small concert venue in Tokyo. According to her Twitter, she was to be performing at the event Solid Girls Night Volume 11. 
Iwazaki, having stalked her social media, knew of the performance that was occurring at the event. So he traveled there and began waiting outside the nearby train station for hours. Eventually, at around 5 p.m., she arrived. Almost immediately upon spotting her, Iwazaki approached. He began furiously shouting for answers, demanding to know why she returned the gifts he had sent to her. Unprepared and frightened, she apparently responded with an unclear answer before turning around to leave. Finding her answer unsatisfactory, Iwazaki ambushed the singer, stabbing her from behind with a pocket knife. It was reported by eyewitnesses that he began shouting, Die! 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 as her screams of pain echoed from the surrounding areas. When law enforcement arrived, they found the pocket knife lying on the floor next to her, and Iwazaki standing nearby. When asked about the attempted murder, he immediately confessed, admitting to police that he intended to kill her. He told them that he'd ambushed her at the station and asked about the gift. Then he lost his temper and stabbed her many times because she didn't clearly answer. In total, Mayu Tomita suffered 34 stab wounds across her face, neck, back, and arms. As a result of her injuries, she fell into an unconscious state, which she would remain in for over a week. She was in critical condition, though her injuries were thankfully non-fatal. None of her vital organs were wounded, and as a result of the attack, she reportedly had trouble eating and singing, also suffering from partial blindness in one of her eyes. She was also diagnosed as having post-traumatic stress disorder, stating in an interview that whenever she sees someone holding something, even if it's someone she trusts, like a friend or a doctor, she becomes extremely nervous because she fears she could be stabbed again. Iwazaki pleaded guilty in court and is currently in jail. He was sentenced to 14 and a half years in prison, meaning that he currently still has 12 more years to serve. Though he since claimed that he never intended to murder Tomita, from his Twitter messages to the eyewitness accounts, there is an abundance of evidence suggesting otherwise. In July of 2019, Tomita filed a lawsuit against the Tokyo Metropolitan Government for its failure to meaningfully protect her, seeking 76 million yen in compensation. Because of their preconceived biases towards social media, they left her vulnerable to an ultimately preventable assault. Although the lawsuit has yet to be settled, her case already forced Japan to revise their anti-stalking laws, placing more significance to threats made on social media. But as you'll see in the next case, this may still not be enough. As technology advances, it's becoming harder and harder for celebrities to keep their personal lives separate. For example, photographs taken using cell phones can reveal sensitive information if the camera's EXIF data is left on the file. This can give stalkers potentially identifying details such as the photographer's cell phone model and even their geographic location. Additionally, the intense scrutiny celebrities must have for when they upload leaves a lot of room for error. The same seemingly minute details that are overlooked by the average viewers can be used by obsessive fans to track down the location of their favorite idol, such as in the case of the second story we'll be talking about today. On September 1st, 2019, 20-year-old idol Anna Matsoko was returning to her apartment in Tokyo. As she entered into the building's lobby, she was attacked by a man who followed her inside. He assaulted her, covering her mouth with cloth, before dragging her into a secluded area and fondling her body. Though she eventually managed to escape, she suffered some minor bruising on the face in the meantime, and immediately reported the incident to the Tokyo Metropolitan Police. Because of the nature of the crime, it took some time before they developed suspects, so it wasn't until September 17th that the perpetrator was caught. They ended up apprehending 26-year-old Hibiki Sato, who upon being confronted confessed to the crime. Initially thinking it was a random assault, he revealed to them that he was actually a big fan of hers and had waited for hours at the bus stop nearby. Although this confession gave a new perspective to his crime, it wasn't until he was interrogated that the true extent of his obsessiveness was revealed, and the disturbingly amazing internet detective work that he had put into finding out where she resided. Matsoka's home address wasn't publicly known information, so no one could figure out how he tracked her down. As it turns out, Sato revealed that he'd been able to identify her location by using selfies she'd posted to social media. 
According to investigators, he'd been able to identify her general location by using a reflection visible in her eyes as a point of reference. Apparently, one of the photographs she posted showed a reflection of a bus stop sign, which enabled him to find the area using Google Street View. He then determined which apartment she was living in by examining the angle from which the light entered her room, as well as the curtains on her window. Upon the reveal of this information, the story quickly exploded in notoriety. With outlets comparing the assault to Tomita's, and readers comparing Sato's techniques to that of science fiction. As a result, there's actually been a lot of controversy over the sensationalism of the story, specifically because the details of how he located her seem so improbable. Some have hypothesized that the purported methods of identification are literally impossible, and he was just bluffing. But it's likely that Sato relied on cross-referencing more heavily than law enforcement led on. Rather than using only the reflection of signs in her eye, it seems more likely that they were only pieces to the puzzle. Realistically, they likely served as confirmation to details he gathered from more obvious clues, such as what shop she visited and what events she attended. Additionally, there were some misinterpretations with the details regarding sunlight and her apartment. One Redditor discussing the crime noted that, The angle of the sun shining on you from 93 million miles away is not different if you're on the first floor or the 50th. The relative change in elevation is minuscule. It's much more likely that he could see trees, or use the visible sunlight to determine what corresponding shadows fell across her building. The actual significance seems to be that it was to determine whether or not she actually lived in an apartment rather than what floor she was on. At the time of recording, the case is still unconcluded, so it's only natural that certain details are unclear. Regardless, the premeditation of his attacks shows how conniving some fans are. While this most certainly isn't representative of all J-pop fans, as a whole it seems like an extremely dangerous industry to participate in. There's been an uproar for the better protection of female idols, as the number of stalking and assault cases over the years continues to grow. At the end of the day, these kinds of industries feed off lonely people and the formation of parasocial relationships. Because of this, it's unclear if an end to this phenomenon is even possible without an extreme reform to the industry's marketing strategies. I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again. It is not okay for you to track down your idol and then stab them repeatedly. And with that thought, I'll end the video here. So until next time, thanks for watching.